Well, hi, it's John Adams here from First Baptist Church of Sweetwater in Longwood, Florida. And if uh, you're listening to this, you must have a really uh, boring week. But I hope that you have a good time studying the Bible with me today. Again, this is a little Bible study I do for the sake of those who are unable to attend Sunday school. The particular focus we're doing right now is from the book of Romans. And um, I'm going to be looking mostly at the chapter, chapter 14 of Romans today, but I'll discuss some with uh, you from chapter 13 as well as chapter 15. But the predominance of this comes out of chapter 14 of Romans. Now, I hope you'll pray for me as I do this. Uh, I know it's going to be too late to do anything about this, but uh, you need to know up front, I'm going to try, try to do my best to cover this passage in a half hour's time. That means I can't hit every verse, but I've got to hit the main issues of this chapter for you. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started with the Word of God. And Lord, this is your time. It's not my time. It's time for you to speak to us. And so I pray that your Holy Spirit would be free to use me and that I would not get in his way as you address our heart needs. We thank you together for the Bible and help us to always study it with an open mind and heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Back in chapter 13, toward the end of chapter 13, uh, the Apostle Paul is talking to the Christians in Rome, and he, he uh, in verse, uh, verse 9 of chapter 13, he talks about loving your neighbor as yourself and love not doing any wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. And for um, the last couple of chapters, Paul's been talking about how the appropriate response of someone who has placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ is to present their bodies as living sacrifices to the Lord for use in his ministry through our lives. He also brings back to the memory of each of us as we study this, the reality that uh, we do that best when we love like Jesus loved. And so when he gets toward this part of chapter 13, he's summarizing and he's talking about love fulfilling the law. You know, when you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all that you are, and you love your neighbor as yourself, the Bible teaches that you're going to fulfill the plan of God for your life and you're going to fulfill the law in every respect. So love becomes the key. And of course, love is a heart matter. It's a matter of whether your heart is true to God and whether your heart is sold out to God and whether you've learned to do what Jesus did with his life, which was to pour his life out as a sacrifice for those around him. And so this is a very, really straightforward way for Paul to come at the issue for Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians there in the church in Rome. And he is very basically saying to them that the best way you can practically live out the great theology that he'd spoken of in the first uh, 11 chapters of Romans is to learn to love each other uh, sacrificially and to literally give the Lord your life. And so this means that for Paul, there's no such thing as a savior without a Lord. That if he died for us and we've received his salvation by faith and the response of the human being to that is to give ourselves in every way that we can uh, in service to God. So let's keep that in mind then as we move into chapter 14, because in chapter 14, he starts talking about something that is really important to especially Christians in America. It's the difference between uh, what we, we tend to emphasize here, which is our personal rights, versus our personal responsibility. Uh, it is easy to get all caught up in, in the uh, infringement of my rights in the middle of the coronavirus instead of thinking about what's my personal responsibility to my neighbor and the people that I encounter in life. What can I do to ensure their safety and keep them healthy? Uh, or do I just think about my right to do anything I want to as an American and to go freely about my business without any restrictions on me at all? And so when he gets into chapter 14, he starts talking about a, a problem of uh, disunity within the church in Rome that is growing out of the freedom that the Gentile Christians are experiencing in Christ versus uh, 
the limitations that are felt by many Jewish Christians who are still in some way tied to their Jewish upbringing. The big picture is this, the best we can tell. If you were raised a Jew at the time that the gospel was beginning to take hold in, in uh, that part of the world, you would have been raised in a, an environment where there were dietary restrictions that came directly out of the scriptures. There were special days to celebrate, to remember certain historic events in the life of, Jew, of the Jews that also grow out of the scriptures. Plus, there are many different layers of expectations that have been placed on the Jewish people through the years by their leaders who had layered one layer after another on the law. So it was a part of their life. It's what they had lived with, what they practiced as far as their religion all of their life if they were good Jews. And when the gospel began to spread across the, the area and the Holy Spirit convicted many Jews of, their, of the truth that Jesus was their Messiah, suddenly they faced a very deep and troubling issue. What is the relationship of, of the Jewish religion of the past to God's plan in the future. And so as the new congregations of Christ followers began to gather, at first they were simply Jewish Christians. That was in Jerusalem where the church first began. And the Jewish Christians there would, would probably have felt very normal uh, keeping the Jewish holidays and, and having a kosher kitchen, as we would call it, because that's what they'd been raised with. That's what their culture had been immersed in. But then a funny thing happened on the way to the Jewish picnic. God dispersed the Christians out of Jerusalem across uh, Asia Minor, and the gospel began to spread into Gentile areas. And guess what? The Holy Spirit did a work in the life of the Gentiles like he had done on the day of Pentecost in the life of the Jews there in Jerusalem. Suddenly now you have a church that is made up of Jewish people who have become followers of Jesus and Gentile people who have become followers of Jesus. Well, those Gentile people wouldn't have had the Jewish traditions and Jewish backgrounds. But when they get together, one thing they do have in common is that they love Jesus. He has saved, whether they be Jew or Gentile, they are both saved because of what God had done in their life. But it did present problems. Uh, because, it, as you can well imagine, the Jews who came to Christ uh, had to make a decision, had to come to some kind of conclusion about what's the relationship of the Jew to the law and to these uh, Jewish holidays, to the Sabbath regulations, and uh, to the kosher or the food laws that are a part of the scriptures. And the Apostle Paul uh, addressed this in several different ways in his letters in the New Testament. And uh, in some cases, he came down really hard on the particular congregation he was writing to. In the case of the church in Galatia, for example, he was very, very uh, straightforward with them that they had replaced the observance of things that came out of Judaism with trust and faith in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. In other words, they were doing what many people today do, which is to say that they believe in Jesus their salvation is in Christ alone, and they have faith in him alone, and yet they really hedge their bets by trying to work their way to heaven. They try to work their way into the graces of God. If you combine faith and works as your plan of salvation, then that would be a doctrinal issue that Paul would really confront you about, and that's what he did with the Galatians. But when we get into the study here in Romans and we find a similar thing going on in the church in Rome, he doesn't confront them the same way because it isn't a doctrinal issue. They're not doing the particular things they're doing as former Jews because they're trying to work their way to they're trying to work their way to heaven. They're not seeing it as a part of their salvation. They're doing it because they love and honor God and they're trying to show respect to God. Now we have to assume that's the case because that's the way Paul speaks it. And that's the way Paul addresses and describes the situation. And so the two situations are different. Uh, and yet there are similarities in that they revolve around the Jewish practice and how it conflicted with the freedom that we have in Christ. For example, as a Christian who, who grew, up, grew up in Missouri and now I'm serving here in Florida, uh, I never had any Jewish background to overcome. 
I may look Jewish to look at me, but I never had any Jewish background to overcome. Uh, I'm, I'm a Gentile, and I came into my faith and just became a, uh, a worshiper in a Baptist church, and, you know, I'm, I'm sort of uh, a part of the Baptist movement. And so as far as any kind of uh, dietary restrictions that grow out of my religion, I have none. I've got a few that my doctor would like me to watch, watch a little closer, but I don't have any religious restrictions on what I eat, nor do I have special days uh, where I have religious restrictions either. So I, I don't face the same kinds of things in terms of the specifics of this situation in Rome. But I have found some parallels in today's church situation, and uh, God willing, I'll talk about some of those as we go forward. With those words of introduction, let me move quickly through this, and I'm going to read a good section of chapter 14 uh, before I make any other comments. Paul writes and says, Accept anyone who is weak in faith, but don't argue about disputed matters. One person believes he may eat anything, while one who is weak eats only vegetables. One who eats must not look down on one who does not eat, and one who does not eat must not judge one who does, because God has accepted him. Who are you to judge another man's household servant? Before his own Lord, he stands or falls, and he will stand because the Lord is able to make him stand. Paul's first argument here is um, revolving around this thing about what you eat or what you do not eat, because obviously there's a disagreement uh, going on in the congregation in Rome about whether it's right to eat certain things. Most likely this would have been meat that was uh, purchased in the market. Uh, you never knew if the meat may have been dedicated to a pagan god before it was placed in the marketplace for sale. And so if it had been dedicated to a, a pagan god, and a Jew, fully knowing that it had been dedicated to a pagan god, he would find that offensive and not want to eat that meat. And so the safest approach might be for the Jew just to simply become a vegetarian. So this is neither a defense of vegetarianism nor, a, or an argument against it. It's not um, an argument for eating meat or against eating meat. But the argument that Paul is going to make right here is that you better make sure that you understand who is the master of your brother or sister in Christ. You are not their master. God is their master. So the big question, Paul says, is whether God is pleased with them or not. Not whether you are, whether you're the one who's pleased or not. He said, you know, you don't, uh, you don't go next door and give orders to your master's slaves. And, and none of them would have ever imagined doing that. And so Paul uses that illustration out of their regular, everyday life. And he says to them, in essence, you've got to remember that as Christians, we are all servants of our master, our redeemer, God. He is the Lord of our life. And then he says, God has accepted that person. So you best not reject that person. If God has accepted them, why are you rejecting them? And finally, he states, he stands, and this is talking about his position and relationship to God, his, his personal relationship with God. He stands in that position because the Lord is able to make him stand. And Paul could have said, if you want some proof for this, just go back to my arguments of the previous chapters, because Paul's made it very clear that the only standing we have is by having faith in Jesus Christ, because God has determined that this is how he's going to make people right with him. You become uh, righteous in the eyes of God by trusting in Jesus Christ and him alone. He goes on to say then in verse 5, he says, one person judges one day to be more important than another day. So now he switched from food issues to special days, probably Sabbaths and other holy days of the Jewish calendar. So one person judges one day to be more important than another day. And someone else judges every day to be the same. Let everyone be fully convinced in his own mind. Whoever observes the day, observes it for the honor of the Lord. And notice that Paul is just saying that a person observes the Sabbath, for example, as a Jew that, that wanted to observe the Sabbath as though they were 
under the Jewish law. If a person wanted to do that, Paul is saying, uh, if he is convinced in his own mind that he can do that and he wants to do that, it would be for the honor of the Lord that he would do it. So Paul is basically saying to him, you should draw the assumption that he's doing this to honor God, not to earn his salvation, nor to appear better than you. And this becomes an issue in this particular kind of disunity. He says, whoever observes the day observes it for the honor of the Lord. And whoever eats, eats for the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. And whoever does not eat, it is for the Lord that he does not eat it, and he gives thanks to God. Now here it's not talking about fasting. He's just talking about somebody who doesn't eat meat. But it is all... Paul is saying this is being done to honor God. In other words, these are people who are practicing these particular religious practices because in their heart, in their mind, they believe that is a way they can honor God. And their heart's desire is to show God that they love him, that they respect him, and that he's, he's number one in their heart. And so Paul is saying if they want to show that and, and demonstrate to God their respect for him by uh, worshiping on the Sabbath or by abstaining from eating meat that's been offered to sacrifices. He said, just understand, that's why they're doing it. For none of us, he says, verse 7, lives for himself, and no one dies for himself. In other words, you're not an island. No man is an island. We do not live in this Christian world separated from everyone else. There's no such thing in the Bible as a Lone Ranger Christian. We're all living this faith in community with each other. But also no one lives or dies for himself is a reference to the fact that we're really now we are God's instruments of righteousness. So we have become living sacrifice dedicated solely to his purposes. And so how we do things and what we do always ought to be considered in light of how that impacts our walk with God, how it, how it impacts our testimony, whether it is pleasing to God or not. So verse 8, if we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and returned to life for this. Now, it's interesting he uses the phrase return to life because Paul will normally just say Christ arose or was resurrected. But here he uses the phrase Christ died and returned to life for this. Almost as though he's trying to get in the minds of the listeners that while salvation was begun on the cross, the resurrection is the living Christ at work in us. So Jesus is not in a tomb. Jesus is alive and at the right hand of the Father, but by his indwelling Holy Spirit, Jesus is at work, is at work through us. And so he, he, is, he has redeemed us for this full purpose. Um, but he says in verse 10, but you, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or are you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. So in one case, he's saying none of us would ever try to tell somebody else's slave what to do in their household. And God has placed these people in his household. They're his servants. So keep your hands off of them. Then he says, why do you judge people for the motives for why they do religious things? Uh, you know, really, you shouldn't do that, Paul is saying. Why do you judge? And he used the term, why do you despise your brother or sister? Well, you see, here's the other side of this thing. If you happen to be a person who practices a particular uh, set of religious practices that are maybe more demanding than somebody else in your church family, your tendency is to develop spiritual pride and to begin to look down your nose at them and say, I'm better than them because, and list the number of things you've done. So you can feel contempt, or he uses the term despise here, because they do not keep the law the way you do or because they do not practice the way you do. Now, let us just give you a silly illustration of this. And, and really, this is... This is as, as much a, a, of an illustration that I think you can relate to as anything I come up with. Otherwise, I wouldn't use it. 
but I've been in ministry 51 years now, and in those 51 years, I've seen radical changes in the church in so many different ways, uh, radical changes in how we uh, do everything. Uh, when I started preaching, I didn't have a microphone. I had to just shout, and we didn't have uh, amplified music of any kind for a long time. And then whenever we did get that, we were basically had a microphone on the pulpit, and the music leader would stand behind the microphone and and sing from there. And we had a piano, and in some cases, if we were wealthy enough to have it, we had an organ, and we might have a pianist playing, an organist playing, and somebody singing through the one microphone into a system that was prone to pick up the local CB radios, and you might get a 10-4 good buddy in the middle of a sermon if you didn't watch what was happening. Well, since that time now, we've come to a point where uh, instead of having uh, auditoriums of maybe 50 to 100 people gathered, we have auditoriums with two to 10,000 gathered. And we have uh, sound systems and electronics that would put an average television station to shame. So things have happened. A lot of different things have changed in just how we do, do church. But you know, one of the things I remember growing up there in, uh, in the Ozarks, I attended a little church called Sharon Baptist Church in Dade County. And uh, we had a wonderful uh, deacon in our church, uh, Deacon Montgomery, and he would he was a farmer like my dad was a farmer and, and I was a farmer's son. And he would come to church in uh, clean and his newest bib overalls. And he would wear a flannel shirt, a uh, clean pressed flannel shirt under those overalls, and he would wear a tie. Now, today in our urban uh, environment, we'd see a guy like that and we'd say, what kind of doofus is that? we'd make fun of him. But the reality was that uh, Deacon Montgomery came dressed that way because he felt like it was the best he could dress and he wanted to show honor and respect to God. Well, nowadays, whenever you go into a worship center on Sunday morning, no matter the denomination, uh, the manner of dress will be from everything from um, beachwear uh, to um, a nice suit and tie it doesn't seem, there doesn't seem to be any kind of place along the way there. It's just everything from, you know, from one to the other. And candidly, Paul would say to us when we fuss and fight over whether you should wear a suit or not to church, he would say, do you wear that suit to honor God? And if so, all right, that's good. That's good. Just don't look down your nose at people who don't wear the suit. Do you, do you go in casual clothes? Fine. If, are you going because you want God to know that you're not there, you're not putting on any kind of costume to cover up anything, you're just yourself, you're the same thing every, that you are every day of the week, and you've just come to worship him? Paul would say, great, wonderful. But don't make fun of people who come in a suit and tie. The issue becomes, you see, how you practice your religion and whether you, in the process, begin to elevate yourself as being more spiritual because your manner of dress in this illustration, or whether you are uh, more spiritual because you're, you're past all that. You don't need to wear a suit and tie anymore to show God your honor. And all those people who still do that, are just they're just out of a different generation. They have no place in today's world. The Apostle Paul would look at both groups and would say, you know, you need to remember that this is your brother or sister in Christ and uh, they're dressing to honor God, however they are doing it, because they come here to serve and worship God and it's not your business to judge them based on how they dress. And that's the kind of thing Paul is dealing with here in the church in Rome because he's got Jewish Christians who are feeling like that they're more spiritual than the Gentile Christians, and he's got Gentile Christians who are laughing up their sleeve at the Jews because they feel compelled to hold all of these rules and regulations that came out of the Jewish faith, and that's no longer applicable. And the issue is, and for Paul, he uses these two terms of judging or despising. Either, either issue, either issue is wrong because it fails to recognize that all of us are accountable to God we all will stand before God. And here he quotes Isaiah out of the Old Testament. As I say, as I live, says the, the Lord, every knee will bow to me, every tongue will give praise to God. 
So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. So he quotes Isaiah where he says, every tongue will give praise to God, which is a sort of a corporate picture. All of us will have to stand before God. And then he very specifically changes the wording when he summarizes it in verse 12. And he says, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. That means whoever you are listening to me today, you will stand and give an account before God, just like the guy talking to you right now. So Paul would say in light of that, it's probably best you focus on your own life instead of what other people are doing that you make sure that you have your own heart and practice right before God and that everything you're doing is doing because you want to honor God. So he said, verse 15, therefore, let us, 13, excuse me, let us no longer judge one another. Instead, decide never to put a stumbling block or a pitfall in the way of your brother or sister. And over in the book of Corinthians, about the eighth chapter, he talked to the church in Corinth about this issue and he told him, you know, some of you feeling all smug because you can eat eat you can eat meat that's been offered us to, to idols and it's no biggie to you. You know it's nothing there. It'd be totally superstitious if you thought there was anything wrong with that meat. He said, I understand that. And he said, I have that same freedom. But he said, I would never use that freedom if it would cause somebody that didn't feel that way to stumble. So if I were gonna have a meal with a with a Jewish brother or sister in Christ, and I knew that they had they had particular conviction in their heart that it was wrong to eat that meat that had been sacrificed to an idol. Paul says, I would go without meat in order not to cause that person to stumble over their convictions. This is the place where I'm talking about the difference in the American mentality of thinking first of my personal rights versus my personal responsibility. As a Christian, we are called to be accountable to God and we are our brother's keeper. We are personally responsible for being followers of Jesus and not doing something that causes someone else to stumble. And so Paul says, I'd never put a stumbling block or a pitfall in the way of my brother or sister. Verse 14, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. This is talking about dietary restrictions here. Still, to someone who considers a thing to be unclean, to that one, it is unclean. For if your brother or sister is hurt by what you eat, you are no longer walking according to love. You see, he's pointing out, you're not being responsible to live a life of love when you just run roughshod over the feelings of your brother or sister Christ. Do not destroy by what you eat someone for whom Christ died. Again, this is a slave who belongs who belongs to the same master as you, and you both became his property by virtue of the one who died on the cross for you. So he said, don't do this, don't do this. Therefore, do not let your good be slandered, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever serves Christ in this way is acceptable to God and receives human approval. So Paul says, if you put other people first and you're respectful of other people and their opinions and their differences, that honors God and God, God's pleased by that. And, and that pleases other people, by the way. You can get along better with people if you're not so judgmental about them and what they do. So he says in verse 19, so then let us pursue what promotes peace and what builds up one another. Do not tear down God's work because of food. Everything is clean, but it is wrong to make someone fall by what he eats. It is a good thing not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that makes your brother or sister stumble. Whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged by the same criteria that you're using to judge others. And this is what Paul is talking about. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. In other words, if you disapprove of your brother, the same kind of critical attitude is appropriately addressed toward you. But whoever doubts stands condemned if he eats. 
because his eating is not from faith, and everything that is not from faith is sin. And this is a basic statement that says, our lives are lived in the presence and direction of the Holy Spirit, and so we should not do things or participate in things that we're not convicted in our spirit or what God wants us to do. That's what it means to be in faith, to be faithfully walking with Holy Spirit according to God's will. And you know that if you're going to condemn other people because they do things differently than you do, that's not pleasing to God because he already, he already has approved them and accepted them in Christ the same way he did you. He says in chapter 15, Now we who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not to please ourselves. So he would say to the Gentiles, for example, in this situation, just because you know that you are free in Christ, that you can eat any meat that you want, you're a weaker, you're a stronger person in this respect, in the faith, perhaps, than your Jewish brother who is still leaning heavily on the law to show his honor and respect to God. Paul would just, he's just said in the verses above, I understand this is, everything is clean, Jesus made that clear in his teachings. Paul, Peter experienced it in the book of Acts when that great sheet was lowered down with all those unclean animals. And God says, take and have a famine or a feast here. Peter said, no, 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 can't do that. It's unclean. And God says, what I have declared clean, I have declared clean. And Paul is saying, you know, I know everything's clean. It's become obvious. Every, there's no, you know, food is not the issue here. The heart is the issue. But he said, don't, you know, understand that you're in a position of strength at this point, and you should be caring and understanding and long-suffering to those, your weaker brother who does not see that and has not been delivered of that particular burden. Verse 2, each one of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself. On the contrary, as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. And really what he's talking about here is this pleasing his neighbors. We're not supposed to be people pleaser in the sense of that. But Jesus certainly did not desire in the sense of going through the suffering and the shame of the cross, but he desired to serve his Father's will. Even in the, in the Garden of Eden, we see him the Garden of Eden, and in the prayer garden before he was crucified, we see him struggling with the issue of going to the cross, asking the Father, is there any other way we can do this? And yet, as unpleasant as it was, he did it because it had to be done in order to serve the needs of humanity, to literally provide a Savior for us. And Paul is talking about the same thing. We're trying to find a way for each of us to serve his neighbor in a way that is pleasing or brings that neighbor closer to God and does not cause that neighbor to stumble on his way to God. Verse 4, for, for whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction so that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement from the scriptures. So Paul says, look, look at the Look at the scriptures in the Old Testament record of how God has worked for the redemption of humankind and that God had, has never had been pleased with people in the sense, but he has always worked graciously to try to do something to lift people from their sin, to redeem them from their sin, and to give them an eternal hope. God has always had the big picture of the, the redemption of mankind in his heart. And Paul is calling us to the same kind of big picture mentality. We need to have a vision that goes beyond the end of our personal satisfaction and our personal comfort. We need to see how can I give up things and sacrifice things in order for other people to experience more growth in Christ and to find Christ as their Savior and Lord. What are the sacrifices I need to make? Now may the God who gives endurance, verse 5, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another according to Christ Jesus, 
so that you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. I'm going to stop with verse 6, even though I could. Maybe I'll go pick up on here in verse 7, 8, 2. But let me just say to you that. Do you see him coming back to the very same theme here in verse 6 that he develops in that chapter 14 about finding unity within the body by learning not to judge, but rather to be accepting toward people who practice their religion differently than us. And Paul would say, as long as it's not a doctrinal issue that needs to be corrected in some way, if it's just a whether you wear a tie to church or not type thing, these are all issues that are sub-minor issues that have no place in the life of the church. They should never not unite us, keep us separated. And, and church fights are just notorious and over the silliest things in the world. So you can come up with your own illustrations of how we get this totally out of, out of the kilter. But Paul is saying that the thing of unity and loving one another is a key issue. It is much more important than whether you get your choice of the color of carpeting in the auditorium or the color of carpeting or uh, material on the pews. Uh, the church is about more than food and drink and days of the week that you worship or do not worship. It is about all of us being submitted to Christ in such a way that we love each other and accept each other and prepare for the day when we will stand and give an account of ourselves before God so that we may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. He says, therefore, in verse 7, accept one another just as Christ also accepted you to the glory of God. For I say that Christ became a servant of the circumcised. This is talking about the Jews. For I say that Christ became a servant of the circumcised on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises to the fathers and so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. He's saying to us, you know, we are accepted in Christ, in, in, in Christ because the Father's love was so great that he sent his only begotten Son, and we've been accepted in him because of what he could do for us. And it was a confirmation of all of the Old Testament promises of the Father. Scriptures talk about it this way, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles, and I will sing praise to your name. Again, it says, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples praise him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will appear, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles. The Gentiles will hope in him. And Paul finishes this particular line of argument with these words. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's, a, it's like a, a summary doxology that he puts like a neat little bow that he ties on the end of this argument that he's making about unity. And he really finishes his argument strong looking the Gentiles in the eye and reminding them of their good fortune that they are in the family of God because of what Jesus, a Jew, Jewish Messiah, did on their behalf. And then he says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. All of us need to stop and think when we read a passage like this and ask ourselves a few key questions. One would be, am I willing to have the same judgment used against me whenever I stand before God as the judgment I use against those that I don't disagree, that I don't agree with or whose uh, manner of dress or manner of speaking uh, is not exactly what I prefer. In fact, we ought to ask ourselves a lot of questions about preferences. How much of these preferences that I have about how to do church today are tied to biblical moorings and how much of them are just tied to my cultural upbringing? What's the, what's the music that you prefer to hear? Well, why is it that that music is better than the music that's preferred by someone else? What justifies that preference? 
we ask ourselves a question of what uh, what kind of heart and attitude do I have toward those who hold different opinions than me, uh, who come at this from a totally different direction? And we need to ask ourselves, does my attitude toward the people with whom I differ cause them to have more hope or more despair? Do I, in my interactions with my Christian brothers and sisters, bring them more joy or more sadness? Am I a person who actually brings the presence of Christ into these debates about how to do church and what's right and wrong, or am I a person who brings dissension and division? Because if you don't ask yourselves those questions today, you won't be able to answer them whenever you stand and give an account of your life sometime in the future. Let's pray. God, help us to have hearts of love and lives of service. And help us, we pray, to prepare for the day when each of us shall give an account. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you for watching. God bless you this week.